Okay. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are tuning in from. My name is Jill Johnson, and I'm the Executive Director for the International Society for Quality of Life Studies, better known as ISQUALS. Uh, we would like to welcome everyone to this webinar. If you came in late, uh, just take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat bar. We're all friendly here. We want to know where you're coming from. I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona in the United States, very early here, uh, but we have people tuning in from all over the world. So just take a moment to introduce yourself. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. A reminder that this webinar is being recorded. We will be posting this on our ISCOL's YouTube channel. If you are not yet subscribed, please do so and share with your friends. Uh, we will send the link to all of you as soon as it is uploaded. As a courtesy also to our speaker and to preserve our bandwidth, we would ask that you keep your video off and your microphone muted during the presentation. Uh, this is set up as a ISQUALS meeting, Zoom meeting, and so not a typical webinar. So please do be courteous to our speaker uh, during her presentation. We will have a time for question and answers at the end of her presentation. Um, and that, that time you can turn on your phone, your, your, your video and your microphone, and we can have a, a regular chat. Um, finally, a reminder that the presentation materials and the video and everything will be posted on our members only forum. Um, we do invite you to consider becoming a member with ISQUALS. And if you are not a member, just by participating today, we will send you a three month complimentary trial membership offer. So that will give you a chance to check it out. It will enable you to receive a fantastic discount to many of our upcoming events including our conference next year. Um, we'll also have live sessions and, and et cetera, all types of fun things that are coming up soon. So please do consider that and check that out in your email. So now to introduce our speaker, we are so pleased to have Milena Nikolova with us today. Milena is a, an associate professor at the Rosalind Frank and, a, and a Rosalind Franklin fellow at the University of Groningen. I hope I pronounced that correctly. She is okay. an affiliated with IZA, Brookings, GLO, and Bruegel. Uh, prior to joining the University of Groningen, she was a research associate at IZA. Nikolova holds a PhD from the University of Maryland in the US at College Park. Her research interests include health, subjective well being, labor market arrangements and automation, entrepreneurship, and economic history. She has published in many peer reviewed journals, including the Journal of Public Economics, Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, Labor Economics, World Development, and Small Business Economics, among others. She is an editor of the Journal of Population Economics. So we are very pleased to have Milena Nikolova today presenting Robots, Meaning, and Self-Determination. With that, Milena, I will turn it over to you. Wow, uh, thanks a lot, Jirov. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, I'm very pleased to, to have the chance to talk about uh, our work with uh, Femke Knossen, uh, who is actually in the audience and uh, can also uh, help uh, with, uh, with questions uh, at the end. Um, and Boris Nikolaev from uh, Colorado State uh, University. And this paper is uh, about the um, consequences of uh, robotization about uh, automation on work meaningfulness and self-determination. So let me tell you um, what this is, uh, this is all about. And uh, I will try to speak for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we can have a discussion uh, at the end. So um, there has been a lot of uh, talk, especially in the media, but also in academic circles about technological unemployment. Yeah, so for example, um, the, the, there is this, uh, this quote that has become uh, essentially a joke capturing the essence of uh, the fear of technological unemployment. So that says that the factory of the future will have two employees, a man and a dog, and the man will be there to feed the dog, and the dog will be there to keep the man from touching the machines. And so uh, this this really captures this this whole the spirit of the of the discourse that we have seen in academia, in the media, and in uh, policy circles. And so. In a way, the origin of, of some of these recent discussions date back to this uh, paper by Fred Osborne. It, it originally came out in 2013. It's a working paper. 
And it had this uh, really scary statistic, scary number saying that uh, they estimated that the uh, about half of jobs uh, in, in the US are at risk of automation in the couple next couple of decades. And so this paper really sent uh, shockwaves, if you will, through, um, through uh, many policy circles, academic circles, and, and the media picked it up and uh, created all kinds of, of scary apocalyptic uh, stories around that initial findings. However, in um, more recent um, work, uh, there has been this uh, essentially realization that it's not a whole occupations uh, that get automated, but rather it's tasks within particular uh, occupations that have automation potential. And so in a more, um, in, in a revised study, for example, they show that um, it's not 47% of jobs in the US uh, that are at risk of automation, but it's more like um, uh, between nine and 12%. Uh, percent. So, so the, the, the numbers vary across a couple of studies. And so, um, the actual uh, evidence related to, to this um, labor saving element of automation uh, for robotization in particular for, um, has also been very conflicting, but on the whole, it doesn't seem that it's all that scary. So there is evidence of actual job loss for the US um, and China. But not in other contexts, not in the context of France, not in the context of Germany and Japan. And there are some nuances and differences within um, these results. But in some contexts, actually automation leads to job creation. And that's a key insight. So it's technology, it's not that technology only replaces uh, tasks and jobs, but technology can also augment or create new tasks. And so this, this whole movement, this whole realization that, uh, and focus on, on tasks um, actually help us understand why these huge uh, job losses that have been predicted by the earlier literature have actually not materialized. And so the, the fact that um, tasks rather than occupations get automated implies that the tasks that we do get modified, which has uh, implications for our job quality. So in other words, the, the fact that it's not that whole professions and occupations disappear means that we should be switching the focus from studying the consequences of automation for the quantity of jobs to looking at what actually happens uh, with the quality of our jobs and how people view their jobs in uh, the automation age. And uh, there has been some uh, literature that has started looking into this. Uh, so specifically in the field of, of health, there have been some, some papers looking at uh, essentially the uh, consequences of automation for things for, for health outcomes and in injuries. So uh, the US evidence is uh, bleak. So in the US, the results show that uh, there, that automation leads to, to worse mental and in some cases physical health, leads also to more drug and alcohol um, abuse, um, but, but fewer on the job injuries. The evidence for Germany related to mental and physical health is a bit more mixed, and it's also more mixed for, for Australia. There also have been some papers that have looked at job quality indicators. There are just a handful of those. They're, they're listed here. And uh, when it comes to job satisfaction, there is evidence that automations or robotization in particular worsens the job satisfaction of uh, workers in, in the United States and in Norway, also in Europe. And moreover, in Europe, we also have uh, evidence that robotization leads to more work intensity, but it doesn't affect any other outcomes related to, for example, the physical environment or the skills or indiscretion people do. So all of this is to say we don't know uh, really 
um, the full extent of uh, uh, to which automation affects job quality and whether and how this depends on different contexts. So um, this is what, what our paper does. It looks at uh, the consequences of automation for different uh, outcomes. And the outcomes that we look at in our paper relate to um, work meaningfulness and self-determination. So I will tell you a little bit uh, more about uh, what we mean by that, but just so that I place these variables a, a little bit in, in, your, in your head. So essentially, if you, if you want to think of uh, about the, the subjective uh, approach to job quality, so how we think about and how we measure job quality, um, in the subjective well-being literature, we're is essentially relying on people's judgments of how their working lives are going. So people self-reported information in surveys. And one can think of several different kinds of outcomes in, 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 um, along those lines. So there is, of course, the evaluation of the overall working conditions, which is uh, essentially job satisfaction or work satisfaction that's elicited through survey questions on, on this particular topic. And then there are also these more momentary, hedonic, or affective mood type of um, of, uh, of outcomes that uh, that the literature has looked at. So related to momentary stress, experiences related to being engaged at work, enjoying particular aspects of uh, your daily work life, etc. And then there is the eudaimonic uh, dimension of, of uh, subjective work, job quality, which uh, relates to work meaningfulness, but other outcomes related to thriving and, and flourishing. So we're in the business of looking at the eudaimonic uh, dimensions of, of subjective um, job quality here. And um, so what the outcomes that we look at are uh, meaningfulness and, and self-determination. So let me explain what, what these are and why we selected them. So work meaningfulness is um, the individual perception of uh, doing useful and fulfilling work. Uh, the reason why it is important, especially to um, instrumentally important, is because it matters for effort. So the effort that people uh, exercise on um, on their job and for motivation. So the, so um, I'm saying, of course, it is intrinsically valuable, but I'm motivating this more from an economic standpoint. Um, that work meaningfulness is not just important in and of itself, but also instrumentally for outcomes that uh, are important for employees, for, for, um, for firms as well. So effort and motivation. People value work meaningfulness a lot. So people are willing to accept uh, something like almost a 40% cut in wages in order to um, enjoy more meaningful uh, work. So this is a study from the US, uh, the estimates um, vary. And um, if you have been following the news uh, lately, uh, me work meaningfulness and the pursuit of work meaningfulness has been linked, uh, at least in the media, to uh, these recent trends that we have seen related to the great resignation that happened during the COVID period, and now the quiet quitting which if you don't know what that is, it's essentially staying on your job, but um, not quitting it, but not uh, um, providing enough effort, not putting, um, not investing too much in your job, just doing your, your the minimum required for you to stay, stay on the job. And so work meaningfulness is, is something that is both intrinsically and instrumentally important, and it's important uh, for, for, for people, at least that's, that's we, what we know from the literature. And in recent work with, uh, with Femke, who is uh, here in the audience, we look at, looked at the preconditions, so essentially the factors that are associated with uh, work meaningfulness. And we, what we found is that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, um, aspects of self-determination uh, theory related to having autonomy, competence, and relatedness in your job are the key 
determinants, the key factors uh, behind experiencing work meaningfulness. And so autonomy uh, relates to having a sense of um, freedom and discretion in, in determining how to do your, your job, essentially. Competence relates to your perception of having the right skills and being able to apply those to uh, your job context. And relatedness is really about the relationships that you have with your colleagues um, and your superiors at, at work, whether you feel valued, whether there is um, is essentially um, support, whether you pro provide support and whether they, they uh, your colleagues and your uh, superiors provide support back to you. And so what, what I already mentioned in uh, a minute ago was that these three factors, the relatedness, autonomy, and competence, explain something like 60% of the variation in work meaningfulness, and they appear to be the key determinants of uh, work meaningfulness, as we found with uh, um, Femke in, in earlier work. And other factors that are uh, other job-related factors, such as, for example, income or the benefits and pay that you're receiving, the career advancement opportunities that you, that you have are far less important compared to, for example, autonomy or relatedness uh, at work. And so some of this may, as, as you're uh, looking at this, maybe some of this can, can help also uh, put in a perspective the, 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 the trends related to the great resignation and uh, the quiet quitting that we have uh, seen in recent years related to, to people um, really quitting their jobs or trying to do as little as possible if they view them as not being uh, meaningful. Okay, so how does, uh, essentially, how does uh, um, work meaningfulness, how do these uh, uh, self-determination variables, the autonomy, relatedness, and competence actually relate to robotization? So how does all of this fit together? So we developed uh, a conceptual framework based on previous studies to help us orient ourselves and uh, form expectations about the relationships that, that we will study empirically. So what we know is uh, that robots often help um, take jobs that are dirty, dangerous, or dull. And if that's the case, uh, maybe the tasks and jobs that are left for, for human beings at the end of the day can be jobs that are providing fulfillment, purpose, autonomy, competence, and provide more time for, for healthy relationships. So talking through the expected effects uh, one by one, if robots are really partners uh, with, uh, with humans on the work floor, um, work meaningfulness can, can extend, if, can, uh, can, um, can increase. Um, if uh, uh, robots really take these dirty, dangerous, and dull jobs, maybe human beings have more time for, for creative and uh, meaningful pursuits. But on the other hand, if uh, robots uh, leave uh, only micro tasks uh, for, for individuals, then the, the meaning that they derive from, from their jobs can decrease. And similarly, individuals can derive autonomy, competence, and relatedness as a result of increased robotization in their, in their work. If humans are in control of the robots, if robots make more time for interacting among colleagues, if they uh, take away the, the dull tasks and uh, um, leave uh, more interesting tasks for the human beings. And on the contrary, robots can, can cause um, uh, essentially less decision-making latitude or less inter fewer interesting tasks or um, disrupt the, the interactivity uh, uh, among colleagues. So we all of this is to say is that robotization can have um, both positive and negative consequences for work meaningfulness and self-determination. And so um, a priori, we don't know uh, in which direction the relationship can, can go. 
And of course, all of these main effects, uh, main relationships can also depend on the tasks that people do, whether they're in they're performing routine tasks, whether they're performing social tasks, whether they're working with uh, computer technology, whether uh, um, they are essentially high skilled or low skilled uh, workers, and can also can depend on. Um, the age and and gender of of the um, of of the workers. So there is this uh, very interesting example that helps put uh, the conceptual framework a little bit in a, in a perspective. So it relates to a drug dispensing robot that was adopted in a hospital pharmacy. And the, the way that this uh, the introduction of this robot affected the tasks and our, so work meaningfulness and autonomy competence and relatedness of different groups of workers within the pharmacy is quite um, illustrative. So there, the, the, the pharmacists, uh, after the introduction of, of the robots, had uh, fewer dull tasks and they had more time to essentially engage with, with, uh, with the patients, to provide them with more consultation and in individual care that led to task augmentation. So essentially robots didn't replace their tasks or replace the dull tasks, but led to uh, augmentation in, in other aspects of, of their jobs, uh, other tasks that they were doing. The system to the pharmacist actually had a less fortunate fate. So the robot uh, pharmacist essentially took over tasks and competencies related to shelving medication. And the assistants uh, saw that their responsibilities essentially diminished. The technicians uh, also saw uh, more responsibilities due to task creation. So they were the only ones allowed to, for example, service the machines. And so that increased uh, their, their competence and um, yeah, um, those aspects of, of, of their job quality. So all of this is to say that um, the job uh, quality effects in terms of work meaningfulness and uh, self-determination um, from uh, robot increased robotization in the workplace are ambiguous and need to be tested empirically, which is what we do. We expect negative effects for those performing routine tasks and those working in routine jobs and those working in low-skilled occupations as well as uh, women who um, have been, so it's uh, previous research has shown that essentially the introduction of robots increases the gender pay gap uh, in European countries. And so as such, we expect that that would lead to less uh, work meaningfulness and um, self-determination for, for women, for example. For older workers, it's not entirely clear um, the uh, what the effect exactly would be, since uh, previous uh, research uh, has shown, for example, that uh, older workers who have survived past uh, waves of automation may not be as negatively affected uh, by it. But on the other hand, all the workers are also less likely to be accepting new technology or adapting to it. And so how it pans out empirically, it's, it's, it's not clear. So what the consequences of robotization for older workers are is, is a priori unclear. So we test all of these. Um, yeah, so hypotheses that, that we have using data from, from various sources. So the, the robots data, the automation data that, uh, that we have come from the International Federation of Robotics. And so we have uh, the number of uh, multi-purpose robots coming uh, and that information is uh, provided to us essentially at the industry level. We have um, uh, two digit industry levels of 13 industries and uh, we have the stock of, of uh, robots in each industry, in each country, in each year. 
And uh, we merged that information from the International Federation of Robotics, which is uh, providing us with the stock of robots with information on the number of uh, workers from the industry, since we want to create uh, a measure of robotization that is, let's say, per worker, so the number of robots per worker. And from this EU claims uh, database, we also use information on uh, ICT essentially. So the fixed capital stock in computing, communications and computer software databases um, at the industry level. So that is a, a, a variable that, that we include also in our analysis. And I'll explain why. And the main, um, the main, let's say, worker level outcome, uh, uh, outcomes and information come from the European Working Conditions Survey, which um, has information on uh, uh, about 1,000 respondents for country per country, and it's conducted every five years. So there are prior data. Uh, we only use data for 2010 and 2015, and there, there have been data collected since 1991, every five years. But those, um, but but not all of the information that we need is uh, covered by them. And moreover, essentially the robots data are only usable and mergeable, if you will, um, after 2005. Um, and the, importantly, we don't have information on the same worker. So it's different workers that are uh, surveyed every every year. So that's important to see. So how do we measure our robots data? So a variable, how do we measure the robotization variable? So for each industry and country and year, we look at the change in robotization, which is essentially the number of uh, robots per 10,000 employees, maybe 10,000 employees in 2005. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, look at essentially the, the change between, uh, so the number of robots from 10,000 employees between year T minus one and year T minus five. So why do we do that? Well, uh, the survey of uh, workers that we're using the European Working Condition Survey has is conducted every five years, as I said. So that's why we're using this um, change that um, ha it spans over over five years, so T minus one minus T minus five. Um, and we lag the robotization measure with one year. So we use uh, last year's uh, robots, let's say, and the robots five years ago to mitigate reverse causality issues. And then finally, we transform the, the, the change, we transform this, transform this difference by using an inverse hyperbolic sign because the distribution of uh, robots is very skewed. Um, so we're just following the state of the art uh, literature here. And so the nice property of this inverse hyperbolic sign is that it allows us to interpret the coefficient estimates as, as elasticities. So essentially we have a change in robotization here um, as our key independent variable. And our dependent variables are based on this earlier work that I mentioned with, with Femke Knossen. So we uh, essentially computed indices uh, based on principal component, component analyses. So we use the polychoric version of this because the, essentially the items are, are um, yeah, non-continuous, so they're uh, binary variables. And so work meaningfulness is uh, measured with these two items. Your job gives you the feeling of work well done, and you have the feeling of doing useful work. So we checked uh, whether the indices make sense statistically. You know, we're looking at the Cronbach uh, uh, alpha and the eigenvalue of the first principal component. Um, etc. So we know that this is not the best way to measure work meaningfulness. There, are, for example, the uh, work is meaning inventory by uh, Steger and, and co-authors, but unfortunately we don't have control over the composition of the European Working Conditions Survey. So we argue in our earlier work that these items are the best that we can do given limitations and we show 
um, that they measure what we're trying to, to measure here. We also look at uh, autonomy or task autonomy in particular. And we capture these with variables about the ability to change or choose the order of tasks, the met methods of work and the speed or rate of work. And again, these are combined using this uh, polychoric principle comp component analysis. We also have uh, competence and relatedness. So, so the last two dependent variables um, and competence is really about uh, essentially the skills to deal with more demanding duties, uh, solving problems and learning new things. And relatedness is about relationships with colleagues and superiors. So it's about support and help from your um, colleagues and your, your manager. And so all of these have been standardized to have a mean of 50 and standard deviation of 10. So we can also compare uh, the magnitudes of robot the consequences of robotization across the different um, outcome variables. So the control variables that we use are, uh, we control for ICT, so information communication technologies. So the variable is again, a change in ICT capital. It's defined very similarly to robotization. And the reason why we wanted to include this as a control variable was because we wanted to really net out the consequences of robotization per se, and not capture any uh, consequences uh, that other technologies may have, uh, like information and communication technology. We also in included individual level control, so the age, the gender, the working hours of, of the worker, the uh, education and the occupation in which they work. And uh, at, the, at the end of the day, we have an analysis sample that is based on workers working in 13 industries in 20 countries. And so this is, let's say, the common set of industries and countries in all of the data sets that we match and merge. We have... Um, we only keep the uh, observations that are not in the armed forces, so there were just too few. And we also drop all other non-manufacturing industries uh, since we only have industrial robots. And we only keep those who have one main paid job. So we, how, how do we estimate what is our uh, empirical strategy more concretely? So we estimate this equation shown here uh, where Y is uh, the work meaningfulness or self-determination of an individual Y working in an industry J in country C and year T. And so we relate their uh, work meaningfulness or self-determination outcomes to the change in robotization. And we include these control variables that I mentioned on the previous slide. We estimate this equation using an OLS, but you may be uh, worried that that's not good enough because there are all kinds of endogeneity issues and we agree with you, which is why we include also a two-stage least squared uh, estimation. So we have an instrumental variable and uh, we instrument essentially robotization. So our key independent variable here with um, the robotization in the same industry in all other countries except for the respondents. Yeah, so for each respondent, we compute the, uh, the change in robotization in the same industry for all other countries in our sample except for the country where the respondent lives. So we cluster our standard errors. We use uh, the survey weights. And we have two analysis samples because um, essentially um, one that is for all other variables and one that is for relatedness because the relatedness questions were not asked for those who work alone um, for obvious uh, reasons. Okay, uh, in the interest of time, I will just uh, show a, a couple of uh, uh, figures here. The first one is, I just want you to get an appreciation uh, for how essentially the uh, robots, uh, the, the, the change in, what the change in robots looks like over the analysis period that we study. 
And uh, I will also show you the, the essentially the, the um, uh, distribution of work meaningfulness so that, that you get an appreciation here. But so, uh, as you can see, robots are more pronounced in certain industries uh, than, than in others. So, for example, in the automotive industry, there are uh, 367 robots per 10,000 workers in 2014. And in some of the industries, such as electricity, gas, and water supply, there's less than, than one robot per, per 10,000 workers. And there has been actually quite a lot of growth um, over time in the adoption of robots. So between 2005 and 2009, for example, across all industries, robotization increased by 64%. And in the 2010 and 2014 period, across all industries, robotization increased by almost 30%. And I want to show you in contrast by industry and year, the distribution of work meaningfulness, remember it's standardized to have a mean of 50 and standard deviation of, of 10. But as you can see here, there is very little variation across the industries in terms of work meaningfulness and over time. So work meaningfulness is not something that, that changes a lot either over time or it doesn't vary too much across the industries. And that's true for also for autonomy, competence and, and relatedness. So that's something to keep in mind for when I will be showing the empirical results. And so here they are. In the interest of time, I want to focus only on panels B and C that show the instrumental variables uh, estimations, so, so the two stage least squares. And so the, um, in each of the columns, you can see the, the different dependent variables of work meaningfulness, autonomy, competence, and relatedness in panel B, and um, the effect of robotization on, on all of these outcomes. So all of these tables include the control variables that I mentioned, like uh, the, cha uh, the change in ICT adoption, the individual controls, but we're not showing them to, to save space. So in other words, this is the effect of robotization above and beyond or net of any individual characteristics and in industry um, uh, occupations, et cetera, effects, et cetera. So the thing to note here in panel B is that robotization essentially leads to declines in work meaningfulness, autonomy, and relatedness, but not competence. And you might be wondering, well, how big are, are these effects that, that you're talking about? And so the coefficient estimates in and of themselves are not interpretable because of this transformation that we did with, with the variable, but the elasticity that, that we're showing here uh, is, is uh, um, what, what we should focus on. So for example, this uh, number of uh, uh, here that is a uh, negative 0.01, shows that uh, essentially um, uh, doubling the uh, stock of uh, robots corresponds to a 1% decline in work meaningfulness. And uh, these are admittedly very small effects, but we argue that they are meaningful given that uh, some of the industries have faced very large increases in robotization and that actually the, um, the, effect, the, the real, um, let's say, growth in automation and uh, robotization and the future waves of, of uh, automation are yet to unleash. Moreover, these um, numbers here hide essentially some heterogeneity that I will show you in the coming slides. So in other words, for some gr groups of workers, the effects are, are stronger and, uh, and for some they're, they're weaker. So here we're showing the average effect for, for each worker. So there is a small negative um, effect for everything except for, for com uh, competence. And if you're wondering, is our instrument doing okay in panel C, you can rest assured that it's, uh, it's doing fine and the, the first stages are, are meaningful and the F stats are, are reasonable. And uh, we have done, um, let's say, the due diligence on that. 
So we have also done some specification curve analysis, and this is to show that uh, essentially the results that we show are independent of whether we look at OLS or whether we look at IVs, whether we include or exclude job characteristics uh, or demographic variables, uh, education and ICT control. And we also did the so-called jackknife, uh, omit one country at a time uh, from, from the analysis sample to, to see what happens to the results. And, and they are remarkably consistent. So this is the specification chart showing the distributions of uh, the, the estimates for all of these um, different specifications. Um, and we have done similar charts for all other outcomes so for the autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And they're available in the paper and, um, uh, and are, are also showing that the results are independent of the variables that we uh, select or the countries that we include or exclude in the, in the, in the analysis sample. So we also tried, if you're familiar with this uh, automation literature, there is a, a, an instrument that has been widely used, which is essentially the replaceable hours and the robot arms from Great and uh, Michaels. We have tried this uh, instrument and it uh, works. Um, the problem with this instrument is that it doesn't satisfy certain requirements like uh, um, it, the monotonicity assumption, etc. So we explain in the paper why we don't adopt it as our main strategy, but for transparency, we show the results with it and they're essentially the same. We also provide results with using employment shares as weights. And the logic of this check is essentially to understand whether um, industries that are more important in, term, in terms of the number of people that they employ uh, can change the results and they don't. And then we also include country near fixed effects and uh, that also doesn't change the results. So here we're checking whether there are any other sort of shocks that industries experience that not only lead them to adopt robots, but also to um, uh, to experience a certain other, other um, uh, events as well, and that doesn't seem to be the case. And so I want to show uh, some interesting results here uh, very quickly, and then I will conclude related to the, um, essentially does, does it matter what kinds of tasks you do and how educated you are? So, so I want to, to show some results related to that. So here we have uh, interacted our robotization variable with variables capturing different types of routineness. Yeah, so repetitive tasks, monotonous tasks, or uh, whether you're dependent on the work base of a machine. And one interesting result that immediately jumps out is that for work meaningfulness, it really doesn't matter whether you do routine or non-routine tasks. Robots are equally bad for your work meaningfulness, if you, if you want to in interpret that rather, um, rather simply. For autonomy, on the other hand, uh, doing re repetitive tasks, monotonous or uh, task or being dependent on a machine, makes the negative, the already bad consequences of robotization even worse. Yeah, so those who work in uh, routine jobs experience an additional um, um, uh, blow, if you will, to, to their autonomy levels uh, um, if they, as a result of robotization. For competence, we only see that monotonous tasks, uh, uh, that while there are no main, main effects of robotization for competence, those with monotonous tasks seem to experience declines in competence. And for relatedness, we have that those working in repetitive tasks uh, as a result of, auto, of robotization can experience uh, more relatedness, possibly if the robots are, are allowing more free time to socialize with, with colleagues. And then when it comes to performing non-routine tasks, so, so tasks related to working with computers, so this is a technology that allows you to exercise control over your work. And when working with clients, so performing social tasks, 
it seems that these sorts of um, tasks or so non-routine tasks are essentially canceling out the negative consequences of robotization on autonomy. For work meaning competence and relatedness, there is not much uh, uh, going on, uh, except for the case with uh, competence and computers. But, but it seems that in the case of, of working on computers, um, those who, who work in, in, with computers experience, um, let's say, a boost uh, of, of robotization that can mitigate some of the negative consequences of, of uh, robotization or fully offset them as uh, when it comes to working with clients. And uh, there are some um, benefits of robotization for autonomy for those who are high skilled and uh, more educated. And in terms of age, we don't find any um, moderating effects. But when it comes to males, uh, interestingly, males, as a result of robotization, feel increases in self-efficacy. So their competence increases, as, as you can see here in the highlight result. So I want to leave some time for discussion. So I will uh, conclude here. So what we find is that we're automations or robotization in particular, is bad for work meaningfulness and self-determination and the effects are small, but they can be indicative of uh, the effects that we might see that might even be larger coming with the next automation waves. The next automation waves are going to be about, or already are, they're happening already about AI and machine learning. And those types of technology are, um, uh, are after the high skilled jobs so they they have the potential to to um to 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 essentially disrupt the high skilled jobs so as we know um the few jobs will fully be replaced by ai but almost all jobs will have some tasks that will be replaced and how that will pan out for work meaningfulness and self determination is really an open question and so our results might help in provide some indication on, on what might happen. And uh, final point about the role of job design. So if technology is uh, adopted with the workers, there could be a potential created for work meaningfulness and job crafting and for the ability of workers to derive self-determination benefits and work meaningfulness benefits, uh, job quality from, from their work. And the flip side of um, not adopting technology where the workers can be um, essentially dystopian scenarios that uh, in some ways are already happening related to algorithmic management, surveillance, people working uh, like robots al alongside the machine. So Laura Norsky from Bruegel, for example, has, uh, has looked into this in, in, in detail. I highly recommend her, her work. And potentially more great resignations and quiet quitting episodes. So that's all I have. I will stop sharing now and I look forward to your comments and questions. Feel free to unmute and ask. Excellent. Thank you so much, Milena. That was fascinating and uh, certainly relevant for this day and age. I'm sure you'll have plenty of opportunities for future research as well, as uh, this seems to be a growing trend. So thank you so much for that uh, thought provoking presentation. This is a time for you, uh, our participants, to ask questions. Uh, we're, we're pretty casual here in this call, so, and in terms of our webinar status, so just raise your hand if you want, or type a question into the chat bar, or even unmute yourself or show your video. Um, we're happy to just have a great discussion about it. Are there any questions? Hmm. Check the chat and see if anybody has any comments. Ernesto? Ernesto, yeah, feel free to uh, unmute yourself or show your video. Uh, yeah, I cannot show my video because the, the host stopped it. Anyways, no um, <laughs> uh, the data showed uh, was the last five years. And uh, it seems that there's no effect whatsoever, or there's no 
skewness in the status quo. What do you expect from the next five to 10 years, if ever? Would it be the same or will there be some dramatic change or it will be all the way up? Can you can I get your prognosis on that? Yeah, so prognoses are of course difficult to make, but so what we what we show is uh, that there's the effect of job quality or subjective job quality as we measure uh, in terms of work meaningfulness and uh, so autonomy relatedness uh, and, and and competence is small. But we argue that uh, this is, so to say, the tip of the iceberg um, and that future automation waves uh, are, which will bite into the, the high skilled workers may actually be uh, potentially even more disruptive. And if the technology is not adopted with the workers, but, but rather in a non consultation the consultation, uh, yeah, with, in non consultation with the with the workers, that that, that can have very detrimental effects for for their job quality, and may lead to even more disengaged workforce and more um, quiet quitting and great resignation. And what we know actually is that the, the new generations of workers, or the, uh, the uh, millennials and uh, and even younger cohorts are different from, from the rest of us, or if, if you're among that group, uh, feel yourself included in it. But so they have, they seem to have different work values and they seem to be uh, really looking for, for purpose and meaning and not so much for monetary compensation. So if technology essentially takes away all the interesting tasks and no, leaves only dull, uh, monotonous tasks, and if it is not, uh, if it deprives workers of voice, we might actually see potentially worse consequences for for um, for their job quality and more quits and resignations. But I uh, I might be wrong. We shall see. Thank you, Monica. Yes, hi. Um, very interesting presentation. Just to clarify, I mean, one of the reasons why the um, why the effects might be muted is probably because you are not really asking workers directly about their uh, experience with robots, but we are merging these yeah. data, right? I mean, you're merging yeah. the data sets from from the industry, and so if you had data where you asked the employees directly are you affected by robots and what is the robot actually doing for you uh, you know uh, how are you affected by robots i would think the effect would be much stronger that's that's a fantastic right? point yeah. no that's absolutely uh, that's absolutely true that's something that i did not uh, mention uh, thank you for mentioning it yes our data are at the industry level and uh, we're looking at individual worker outcomes so sometimes there might be as in an industry like the automotive industry where there are more than 300 robots per 10,000 workers that's still a high penetration ratio but that doesn't mean that the individual worker that uh, i'm assigning that uh, that industry value to has contact with, with robots. Um, our data are also on the number of robots, not about their quality, not about their feature, not about the particular tasks that, that they do. And in recent years, so for example, I was just chatting with a colleague who uh, was, was commenting that in certain countries, the number of robot stocks are declining, but that's not because they're using fewer robots, but because now they have this one giant robot that is the amalgamation, if you will, of, of three robots or something like that. So you won't be able to see that in these aggregate industry numbers. And you're absolutely right about that. Yes. So it would be really interesting to come, I mean, to really do a survey uh, or if they if they could include some of those questions right re directly about robots, how does a robot affect you um, in the in the European worker well-being survey or something that would be really useful, right? 
Yeah, they, they did include such a question in the latest company survey asking the managers essentially, but unfortunately the data between the workers and the, the company, so the manager survey and the worker survey are not linkable. That's that's a shame. But there are some, some a few data sets that are linkable, but they don't have outcomes on job quality. So data limitations are a huge flag here. You're absolutely right. Well, okay, so so there's uh, opportunity for for further research. I absolutely. guess absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you for this great point. Uh, Chris, hi, Lena. Uh, I have a question, maybe going in the opposite direction, uh, which is, uh, can you say anything about how? these effect sizes would map onto life satisfaction effects. So I'm always a little less sure how to deal with domain, how to interpret domain satisfaction. And I'm in principle or in general, imagine it may shift in ways which don't map simply onto life satisfaction. So can you say anything about what you would expect if you were looking at life satisfaction rather than job quality? We don't have life satisfaction data, unfortunately. We have job satisfaction and the effects were negative, but I have not done the comparison. But what is your what is your um, intuition here? I'm not sure I have any. Uh, I, I mean, well, no, it's not intuition. Uh, concern would mm -hmm. be that um, uh, that people's priors, people's expectations about their about how jobs work may um, shift with time, may adapt or something. So that if you look at effects in a subjective job quality, that might not be uh, those might not be sort of permanent or real effects on overall life satisfaction. I don't suspect that's the case. I just mm -hmm. uh, that that's a concern. I. Yeah, I understand that. So, but, uh, but I mean, the I, artifact uh, essentially. So the, the the strange thing is that work meaningfulness doesn't change too much over time. We have looked into this uh, for for three years, which is when we have data: two thousand five, ten, and uh, fifteen. And so, yeah, work meaningfulness is something that doesn't doesn't vary um, too much. But I, I see your concern. You want to cross check essentially with um, with with life satisfaction, which is let's say a more stable component of of uh, subjective well well being. Yeah, we can do that with job satisfaction, even though it's uh, not um, not the same. Um, but but I see the point. Of, of what you're seeing. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Thank you. Thanks. By the way, Antonia and I uh, checked whether there are any uh, health effects or subjective health effects in any sort of um, uh, health conditions and there is nothing there. So none of the health conditions are affected. And so that's also uh, what some of the results for, for Europe show more generally in the literature. So for the US, there seems to be negative uh, effects in terms of health, but for Europe, that doesn't seem to be the case. Possibly because in Europe we have, and also in Canada, yeah, of course, uh, we have, um, yeah, so, so more labor mar uh, market institutions and, and that, that protect against uh, different kinds of, of shocks in the labor market. I actually don't know what the, the data for Canada are. I just suspect that. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, are there any other questions, comments? Uh, one final question, Milena. Uh, if if anyone wanted to uh, get in touch with you, um, I assume we can share your presentation and and your email address uh, after the when we post it in our member form. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. I'm also posting. My oh, she email posted in, in the uh, chat. Great. In the chat, but I will share the slides. Yeah, please. Uh, we are doing some follow up work on this. So please, please get in touch. And um, um, yeah, please, please let me know if you have any comments, questions, concerns, objections, et cetera. And Milena will be at our conference in 2023. 
in her home, hometown or home area of Netherlands um, in Rotterdam. So um, if you do plan to attend, you'll be able to meet her in person. <clears throat> That's planned for the end of August in 2023 in Rotterdam, Netherlands. So um, Melena, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Thank you all for participating for some great questions. Um, as I said in the beginning, we'll be sending the recording of this webinar. Um, it is post will be posted on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to that as well. If you are not a current member of ISCOLS, we will also send you a free trial membership offer for three months. So you're welcome to join us and check us out there and then uh, participate in our member forum. So with that, we'll say thank you again to our presenter, Melena. Thank you so much for your time and thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thanks for the great questions and uh, hopefully to be continued. Definitely. Absolutely. All right. Take care, everyone. Good. Have a good day or good evening for wherever you're tuning in. <laughs> Thanks, Melina. Thank you. Bye, all.